Hi, everybody. Just a little bit of housekeeping. Can you zhuzh in a bit? Just If you could just move in a little bit, it'll just open up some seats on the aisle. So as people come in, they have somewhere to sit. Thank you so much. And I'm going to turn you over to John Durandini. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Um, I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of this land. My name's John Giardini. I'm a child psychiatrist from Adelaide, which is Ghana land. And I'd like to express my gratitude for the good life that I lead on Ghana land. I also acknowledge that I have that good life as a direct consequence of colonisation, so that we do have a responsibility to try to repair the impact of actions taken by others, be they now or in the distant past. It's uh, my great pleasure to introduce um, three discussants to you today. Um, Jennifer Finlay Boylan, sitting in the middle, who's an academic, uh, New York Times columnist, author of 15 books, several of which are novels, but um, also this very important book about at today's subject, She's Not There, A Life in Two Genders. Uh, Jasper Lees, to my immediate left, a Tasmanian activist um, in uh, removing laws discriminatory to transgender and gender diverse people. And uh, Marty Hasselton at the far end, an evolutionary psychologist, international authority on sexuality, um, whose most recent book is called Hormonal. Um, and uh, I want to begin by asking um, Jasper, what, what brings you to this stage today? Uh, so, obviously I'm a trans man, so I transitioned at the age of 18 from female to male. Um, and after doing that, I came, in, came to a legal hurdle in that I couldn't change my legal sex. So all of my documentation still says Jasper female. So um, my mum, who is the Greens leader down here, I went and talked to her about it and I said, hey, listen, this is a slight problem um, because a lot of trans people I know have the same issue as I do and it's a very big legal hurdle in a trans person's life. So um, we started a, a reform process to change those laws and I did a lot of media around that from the trans person's perspective on how these reforms work and how they help people. And um, because of that, all that public talking, I got asked to do more. So that's why I'm talking here about my experience being trans, that kind of idea. Thank you. Marty, what brings you to this panel? Um, I, so I'm a, I study hormones and behavior, and I tend to study things as they happen in adults. Um, another thing that, and, and so that is my background with respect to hormones. Um, I teach a class on sex and gender. I'm a professor at UCLA. And in the course of teaching that class, we define a number of terms. And we found that there are even more terms to define as we've moved along. We've been teaching the course for about 10 years. Um, among those things are um, terms that we use to describe trans people um, and as a way of illustrating for the students what the life of a trans person is like and, and what it might be like for um, somebody who's considering transitioning, we have interviews with trans people from the community. And that's always been a highlight of the class and it's always pushed up against some really interesting assumptions that we have about male and female and where the boundaries are between the things that make us um, because of you know, who we are biologically inside, because of the differences within us, um, how that impacts our social lives. But things are different with all of these um, alternative, um, non-typical identities. And so that's really been an in very interesting to me from a scientist's perspective, trying to figure out, you know, what are the puzzle pieces of, for example, our mating lives and our sexuality. And um, when you move one puzzle piece, Perhaps you um, move, the, move the piece of your identity being your natal sex to another sex. What else might change along with that? Maybe nothing, maybe a lot of things. Um, so it's very interesting to me from a scientific perspective, not only because of the social implications, but also because it can help us carve biology, carve nature 
potentially more neatly at its joints. And we've been doing some research in my lab to study some uh, other identities. For example, we are very interested in asexuality. Um, so I, I come to this as an interested observer, um, somebody who has thought a lot about hormones and behavior and hormones and sexuality, um, and also just somebody who's super curious to hear more about um, the experiences of our panelists, for example. So Jenny, when I suggested to you that you might answer that question, um, you uh, said that there was a piece that you'd written recently that you might share with the audience. And right, so as a, as a storyteller, I tend to think, think in terms of stories. Um, and I, I thought I'd begin actually by reading a story. Um, so I'm a transgender woman, I've been out for 20 years. Um, and one of the things I hope we'll talk about is how are things different? How are things? How were things different for Jasper when Jasper came out um, than they were for me when I came out 20 years ago? Um, and I'm really looking forward to talking about hormones because um, uh, they are powerful. And my and my, and I um, my female identity is not only a result of hormones, but definitely when I when I began um, hormone therapy, my sense of the world really did change, and my sense of self changed mm -hmm. as well. But I'm also here because um, in addition to being transgender, uh, I had the transgender child. And um, yesterday, some of you might have heard the sermon that I gave talking about my own experience in coming out and how amazing my 85-year-old um, Republican conservative mother was to me, who essentially opened her arms and told me that love will prevail. Um, and when my child came out to me as trans, um, that was not my immediate reaction. My, my immediate reaction was to freak out. Um, so on that happy note, I'm going to go over to the podium. I hope it's not too creepy for me to leave, leave you. <laughs> Will you wait for me? I'll be back. We'll, we'll <laughs> okay. I just, there's something about um, reading a story. I like to stand up to do it. So this is about five minutes long. So it's, believe me, you're not stuck with me the rest of the morning. Here it goes. Ready? <clears throat> At the end of the long weekend, when my daughter came out as trance, she headed back to her car with her girlfriend. I watched them from my apartment window as they packed up. My child looked up and waved. Then she drove off. I closed the window, and tears rushed to my eyes. She's saying goodbye, I thought. I'll never see her again. This, of course, turned out to be malarkey. In the months to come, I'd see her lots of times, and each time she seemed happier and more herself. And in fact, since I wrote this, she's now engaged, so there you have it. But you'd think that as a transgender person myself, I'd have rolled right along with my daughter's unveiling. You'd think that I'd have been able to show even half the grace that my 80-year-old Republican evangelical mother had shown me almost 20 years before. In spite of everything I know about being trans, I still had lots of my own dreams tangled up in my daughter's, formerly son's, life. I loved that child exactly as they had been. And the idea that this person was now going to be different made me think, at first, that something precious to me was being taken away. If it was a struggle for me, I can only imagine how hard it is for other parents. Unfortunately, what many other parents are receiving right now is not encouragement to find wisdom and understanding. What they're getting instead is a bogus new diagnosis, rapid onset gender dysphoria. The inventors of this spurious term claim that ROGD is not a real trans identity, but the product of social pressure. A writer in the Wall Street Journal described it as, quote, a social contagion. She says that young people, many of them college-aged, most of them female-bodied, are embarking upon transition with its surgeries and hormones and other accompanying challenges in the same way a person might take up the ukulele. Even the headline on the essay in question was an insult. It was, when your daughter defies biology. An abundance of scientific research makes it clear that gender variance is a fundamental truth of human biology, not some wacky dance craze. Transgender people have not come up with the entirety of our existence solely to hurt, oh, I, for, I forgot his name. Um, in America, the, in, in, Alan Jones. what's the name? Alan Jones. Alan, 
have not come up with the entirety of our existence solely in order to hurt Alan Jones's feelings. <laughs> We do not embark upon transition because it's groovy. We're here because our hearts demand it. ROGD is not a clinical term. It's a political one designed to undermine the validity of these young people's transitions. The term originated a few years ago on three blogs with a history of promoting anti-trans propaganda. There's only been one study on it in the journal Plus One, but that study wasn't about the children in question. It's about their parents who were recruited for the study by ads placed in the conservative blogs that had invented the concept of ROGD in the first place. A child's transition can indeed seem heartbreaking for parents at first. I understand that because I am a parent who, in experiencing it, felt as if my heart was breaking. And we, trans people, we need to understand that too. It was heartbreaking for my own mother, even though she told me love would prevail. It was heartbreaking for me in spite of or because of the fact that I'm trans myself. What was my problem, you ask? Above all, I did not want my child's life to be hard in the way that my life has been hard. But if you want your children's life to be hard, the quickest way to that end is to tell them that their deepest sense of self is nothing but a fad and that you know them better than they know themselves. I've noticed something fascinating since my child came out and it reflects the difference between generations over what being trans means. When I began to share my truth almost 20 years ago, I spent a couple of years going around to people, apologizing, begging for understanding, begging at times for forgiveness. But my daughter's generation, and Jasper's generation, I think, is different. She has never apologized for who she is. Since she came out, her friends have reacted with joy and happiness for her, even, dare I say it, indifference. Their sense is that being trans is just one more way of being human, and surely no sense or source of shame. That's a lesson that people my age still need to learn. Being queer is no longer something that needs to be tolerated or accepted or forgiving. It never was. What it is, is one more way of being human. And the proper response to our children's humanity should be love. That's true whether they turn out to be trans or gay or straight or Alan Jones. <laughs> they are here to, they are not here to live our version of who we think they ought to be. They are here to be themselves. When my child raised a hand to wave at me, my first thought was that my son was saying goodbye. I was wrong. It was my daughter saying hello. Yeah. Oh. Right. Thanks. Oh. That's a tearjerker. <laughs> You guys talk for a little bit, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> Any reactions from? That's beautiful. Thank you for, so much for sharing that. Thank you. Um, I, I, it's making me a little tearful, too. Um, I, we all need a moment. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say that I completely agree that um, it, is, we, it is so nice that we live in a world where we're respecting more diversity by actually giving people a voice and giving people a way of connecting with others who are experiencing the world the same way that they are. There are all these different ways to be human, as you aptly say, um, and people are beginning to adopt and explore them. And they are not, certainly there are many exceptions, but they're not being judged as harshly as they were in previous generations. And that seems to be a real shift and a really remarkable and rapid shift. And along with that has come things like the diagnosis that you mentioned um, and concerns that some kids might be transitioning because, you know, for, for reasons other than, you know, real genuine discomfort with their, with their assigned gender. And that's something perhaps that we can discuss. But I just, I think that we are living in a moment now, which I am grateful for, 
where we just have a menu of possibilities, of possible identities, and we don't even have to fall into one of those boxes. We can occupy some space in between, and people are, have woken up to the idea that it's okay. So that's the way you are, that's great. So, so mm -hmm. Jenny, what should it have been like when you were a teenager? How would you like to have been, what would you have liked to have had around huh. you? Well, so I, I'm 60 now. I came out when I was 40. I grew up in the 60s and 70s. Um, and um, I mean, I, I came out when I could. I mean, I, I um, and, and, and I wonder, I mean, I look at Jasper and I think, I, I just kind of have such wonder and um, admiration for you. And I wonder what kept me from being able to come out with my truth when I was when I was five, because I knew it when I was five, it was I mean it was an absolute certainty. It's one of my earliest memories um, uh, is that I was that I was somehow wrong. Or, I mean, I, the, the the language that I had for it changed as I grew older, um, as I came to understand gender and sex. You know, I mean that's 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 a thing that changes as you um, over the course of your life, in fact, but. I, what I knew was that it was something, somehow I knew this is something that was wrong and that I had to keep secret. Um, and I kept it secret until I was 40, in fact, mostly, except for talking to a few um, therapists and the like. Um, so, um, I mean, on some level, I, I, I wish I'd come out when I was five because I think I would have been able to live a life um, that was less traumatic. Um, because in, the, the, the trauma is not, or the, not the trauma, but the big thing was not going from male to female, the, really. The big thing, for me anyway, was going from someone who had a secret to someone who didn't have a secret. And lugging not just a secret around your whole life, but, but a profound secret about who you are, that you're hiding from the people whom you most love including, in my case, my spouse, um, th that's, um, that's the hard thing. But I, I, but I, I think I felt like I, I wanted to give the boy thing a go. I wanted to get, you know, I, I didn't want to let you, down. You gave it a really good go. I didn't want to, I didn't want to let down the side. <laughs> um, Jasper, can you can you talk about your experience and how it might have differed from what what Jenny's described? Uh, yeah, so I think obviously there's 20 years difference between these times of when we transitioned, but um, when I was growing up, my earliest memories from when I was three are declaring to my family that I was in fact King Max and not Queen Mara. Um, so it's it's a very uh, early decision you make in your mind, not even a decision, a, a realization, but. Um, it wasn't until the age of kind of 16, maybe 18, somewhere in that gap, where um, I discovered that trans was a thing and that it was okay and that it existed. Um, and it wasn't until then that I got the facilities to be able to communicate that I was trans. So, um, growing... So did it go underground for those years? Where, I mean... Yeah, oh, well, it was always there. It made me a really angry teenager, not being able to communicate this feeling. Um, but not having the ability to communicate to my mum and my dad what was going on because I didn't quite understand it. It was just like this overwhelming feeling um, was kind of the hard bit for me because as soon as it happened and I came out, which was quite, you know, fiery, um, then it was like my ability to move on and transition was really easy as far as it goes. So. I so think, you say that was fiery. Do you mind saying a bit more about what happened? Well, yeah. <laughs> so at the time when I came out, um, I was a really, really angry teenager. I didn't have my emotions in check. I would get, like, I'd cry a lot. I'd scream a lot. I'd punch holes in the walls if I felt like it. Um, so when I came out, I was at my dad's house with my brother and sister and my stepmom, and um, some, we got into some conversation about why I was angry all the time. Um, to which I didn't have an answer, which really frustrated me. Um, so I got angrier. So I ended up yelling at them, well, maybe I just want to be a boy. And they were like, well, hey, that's actually quite a big thing to drop on us. Mm -hmm. um, so it was 
the way, my way of coming out was just yelling at them my feelings because I didn't understand how to communicate them in a way that was, hey, I understand this is okay, so I want you to understand that it's okay because I get it. But um, it was more just, this is what I'm feeling and I want you to feel it too. Um, so it, it wasn't an easy way of coming out, but it was definitely effective. Um, <laughs> so, you know, after that um, initial screaming match, which was just one-sided, I was screaming at them, um, <laughs> We kind of, you know, talked about it, about what it meant and how to go through those steps to medically transition. Um, and it was, as far as most trans experiences goes, incredibly privileged and easy. Um, it wasn't easy, but, you know, in comparison. Um, so I feel very privileged to be able to transition medically and have the, you know, funds and support to do that. Because um, I understand a lot of people, it isn't a possibility. Um, so for me and my generation, I think it's a lot easier compared to you know 20 years ago when it just wasn't really a thing or no one knew. It was yeah, a man, thing. I felt like I, I felt like I spent a year or two just exp like explaining what yeah. it was. I yeah. remember somebody said to me, like, "So what? What are you saying? You're like super gay?" <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I didn't have any of that. There was definitely <laughs> explaining like what trans is to people and that it's okay, but it wasn't like, I didn't have to say trans is a thing, because, you know, it, people existed in the media at that point to be able to do that for me. Could, could each of you talk about what it was like to go through puberty, the physical and emotional experience, you know, these physical characteristics that were emerging in you that were the wrong physical manifestations of mm. gender? What, what was that like? <laughs> there, 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 there were really two things going on at once, and part of which was like, because, you know, in a, my sense was, I didn't want this to be true. I mean, I would pray at night. I would say, I mean, I had two prayers, one of which was, God, please let me wake up in, in the morning as a girl, and the other one was, God, please make me stop needing to be a girl all the time. Like, what's the deal? What's this, what is this gift you've given me, you know? What's the superpower, like? You know, couldn't I have just had super strength instead? You know, uh, <laughs> something practical. Um, and uh, so, as, as, when I went through puberty, part of me was like, "Okay, now, now we're gonna get with the boy thing. Now, here we go, yeah." Um, and um, and part of me was like, "It was like." Actually, in some ways, the hard thing was that that my my female friends. As, as they went from girls to women. That for me was like standing on a dock watching a ship sail off at sea um, and um, feeling left behind and knowing that the, I would spend the rest of my life. Because I, I just never, never thought I'd ever have the courage to go through transition. I just felt that I was gonna be um, left behind the rest of my life. And I'd be left having to fake manhood. I would have to somehow um, spend the rest of my life imitating something that I wasn't because, you know, the last ship was, had left. Mm. Yeah. A similar experience, possibly not so, like, socially hard, but, like, the physical, especially with female puberty, the physical changes are so, like, intense. It's like, oh, now I've got boobs. <laughs> right. Oh, period, cool, that's interesting. Um, so those changes to me were kind of the most traumatising bit because I was like, well, this is happening and it's happening to my sister and my stepsister and they're cool with it, but I feel like outwardly uncomfortable with the way my body is changing. Not, not so much that it was like puberty is just like a weird time. I would like look in the mirror and be like, that's not quite right. Like something doesn't add up here. Um, so it was... Like, my dysphoria, which is, like, a discomfort in your gender, um, was so intense those years after puberty started, well, my first puberty, um, <laughs> that it was like I couldn't really think about much else. Like, I didn't think about other people or finding a partner or anything like that because it was like I was so consumed in how weirded out by my own body I was that it was like I had to find a way to either accept it, which wasn't going to happen, or, like, change it. So... For me, until I had top surgery and started hormones, it was like I felt so 
so awful in my body. It was like I wanted to peel my skin off. It was. And like, yeah, really... then, and then you said the first puberty because yeah. that's that's the thing. When you transition, you then go through the second adolescence, so fun. which is, <laughs> it's like yeah, the first time was was fun enough, yeah. and now we'll go. <laughs> And for me, I did it, you know, like I was in my late 30s and early 40s. Mm. Um, and what's the phrase? Is it ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny? It's a, a bio, well, the, the, I went through that. I, I had to go through each evolutionary phase before I could reach 40. So like, you know, I started on estrogen and then, you know, there was like, like a couple months of like wearing stretchy t-shirts and like, you know, here's my belly button, you know, and people are like, you know, Dude, Pretty you're 40. Way. Put that up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then you know I went through like kind of young professional, you know, and I had lots of like dress for success clothes. <laughs> and basically, I had to go through um, female evo uh, evolution is the wrong word, but um, morphing through yeah. through each of the phases of my life that I'd missed. And I kind of, but I kind of started out as like a 70s hippie because that's where all the girls. That's where. That's when I missed the boat. That's when we were all wearing, you know, like, you know, Indian print T-shirts and paisley, yeah. and um, and I had to get somehow I had to find my way to the 2000s. <laughs> um, and, until now, it's like um, I I don't actually. I mean, I'm wearing a dress today. I think this is the first time I've worn a dress in, in six months because I wanted to make a good impression here in <laughs> in, in, in the in the judgmental Hobart you know, Hobart, Hobart yeah, <laughs> but um. Um, you get, I think, in early transition, you're, you're kind of trying to... Um, I have to compensate, almost. Yeah. Yeah. Did you go through that? Oh, yeah. There was, like, I mean, it's a big thing in the trans male world of, like, some of them go so far beyond I'm a boy to they just turn toxically masculine, and it's, that's a different problem. Like, to like seriously toxic? Oh, so bad. So bad. Because, like, some people in the community will be like, well... I mean, you don't want a beard and you don't want to wear a suit, so you're actually not a boy. It's like, well, that's not how that works. Um, but it's a, a lot of the early transition time is like you're trying to justify yourself to the outside world and to yourself. So it's like you do things like, like I used to shave my shot sideburns so they'd be more masculine, so they'd be square. So it was like, that was my way of being like, well, I'm a boy, so that's cool. Um, but it's like you dress that like more mask. I dressed before in like shorts and like baggy t-shirts because that was like the way boys did it, and yeah. that was the way you had to do it. But now it's just like what you're comfortable with. But you see, this is the thing that um, cisgender people, and if, if you don't know that word, cisgender, C-I-S, is is if you're not transgender, you're cisgender. Trans means to go from one side to the other in Latin, whereas cis, C-I-S, means to stay on the ones. So if you don't know that word, cis is to trans, as straight is to gay or as gay as to straight. Anyway, cisgender people go through this too, right? Yeah. That you have to prove, or, or not prove, but um, you know, your masculinity or femininity is, is, is a question of, you know, um, like as a woman now, I feel like, um, you know, do I, do, I have to, um, do I have to prove to people that I'm a woman um, by, uh, by putting on makeup? Um, right. and, and since transition, I'm now more androgynous. Uh, like when I first came yeah. out, I spoke like this all the time because I wanted everyone <laughs> to really have a sense of me as female. And I went to a voice therapist, and she told me that my voice should go up at the end of sentences oh. all the time. Because that's, <laughs> if you want to be a woman, you have to sound uncertain. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I finally, and I just let it go because, um, <laughs> I feel like now my womanhood can't be taken away from me. But yeah. I think it's worth noting that that uh, that that, <laughs> cisgen, that people who aren't trans go through the same thing yeah. in a way, yeah. and that you have to figure out how much do I want to fit in, and how much am I just going to goddamn be thing. myself? Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, are you guys still here? Yeah, <laughs> we are. We're, I'm, I'm fascinated. I, I, I was going to ask you to because there, there's another kind of, we, we heard about making a transition at 40, making mm. a transition in late mm -hmm. teens, mm -hmm. but now there's the capacity to delay puberty, so right. that you only go through one puberty. Yeah. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about puberty delaying hormones Ooh. and the, yes. the well, positives and negatives of them? Sure. What I, what I know about this, <coughs> so this is outside of my area, I, I um, study grown adults who've already um, 
been through <laughs> these big changes, um, associated, puberty and second puberty. They, they are where they are. Um, but there, there are ways. Um, GnRH is a hormone that is involved in lots of different things, but it, you can administer this hormone, and it will stop um, pubertal development in someone who is considering transitioning or is on the path towards transitioning. And so you could avoid, presumably, some of this trauma that you both experienced by, by doing that. The thing that's tricky about it, it's effective in doing that and in, in slowing down or stopping puberty, pubertal development. But the tricky thing about that is what if a person embarks on this journey, especially a very young person, you can think about your identity um, when you are young, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, um, there are parts of that identity that definitely stay with you, and then there are other things that you will tend to shed as you move through life that you feel don't fit you as much. Um, and so it's entirely possible, and in fact there have been instances of kids who decide to transition, families, because it's going to be a family decision uh, for kids at that age, um, who, who start to t transition and then decide that, that in fact um, their natal gender, the gender they were assigned at birth, is perhaps more appropriate for them. Um, the effects of suppressing hormones are mostly reversible, but not entirely. So um, one thing that doctors will warn about is that your height, so a lot of your final height, is determined by the growth spurt that you experience during puberty. Um, and so this is one of the reasons why doctors are so interested in tracking puberty and measuring height, because they're trying to see how things are progressing. If you, uh, if you slow down puberty, um, then you might reduce the final height of the individual. So that's just one thing. Perhaps we, um, a family makes a decision that that is a trivial thing um, and not terribly important. Um, but, or maybe they don't. But what the, a more general point is that we don't have a lot of information about what all of the pros and cons are here. Um, so, so that's, you know, it is reversible and, and a lot of people will talk about, well, this is fairly low risk because it's reversible, but it may not be fully reversible. Once then um, individuals start to treat their bodies with hormones in order to achieve a more masculine or feminine appearance with estrogen or testosterone, uh, testosterone for male appearance and estrogen for female appearance, um, those effects um, are n not fully reversible either. And so we kind of have to think about both of these things. We have to think about both um, treatments separately. So do we slow down pubertal progression? And that's mostly reversible, but maybe not entirely. And maybe there are some things about that that we don't fully understand. Um, do we administer male and female hormones to um, feminize or masculinize appearance, and what are the consequences of that? Those are not fully reversible. There are some structural things that happens to, happen to our bodies and our brains um, that are achieved by the action of hormones during pr um, puberty, and you cannot change those sort of structural changes. Um, they are there and they are set for the most part. Um, so that's a, that's a real consideration. There's also um, a possibility that sterility can follow from some hormone reg regimen. So that's, that is a more aggressive form of treatment, hormone treatment, for somebody who's wishing to transition. And um, most medical standards require that the person feel as though they are of the gender to which they wish to transition for a a sizable period of time before they start taking the hormones, and, and there's a reason why that policy is in place. Would either of you like to comment on that? I don't know much about it, so I'll probably keep away from it. Uh, well, there's, so those are the dangers. I, uh, the the uh, pluses and the minuses. And, and I hope I hit the pluses we, too. We did, but I mean, so, so this is the hard thing for parents, and I speak not only as someone who's been through this, but as a parent. I, I was someone who went through this, and I'd longed for it my whole life, and finally, um, I, I started up on estrogen, and my life has been really great since mm -hmm. then. And I also speak as a parent who <coughs> loved a son, just as that son was. And that son told me that she was trans, and she was uh, going to begin the process to become my daughter. And I was like, shit, really? Um, I mean, I got with the program, and now I celebrate, and I love her. But my first reaction was, um, that I felt like something was being taken away from me. So this is the hard thing. On the one hand, 
you treat your child so that they so that they don't wind up um, with a with a lifelong um, sadness and a sense of wrongness, mm -hmm. um, if, assuming that the transcend that it takes. On the other hand, you know you you, you don't treat your child, um, and you know and they and they and they. You know, and they have to wait until they're 40 or, 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 or so. I mean, I know people who've done it in their 70s. Um, but, you know, or you treat your child and it turns out they're not, they, they're not trans and, it does, and it's not a good choice for them. And so now you have the risks mm. of the growth spurt, the, the um, sterility, other things. Um, so it, it, it's a very, this is a really, the reason why this is so vexing is because there's not a one size fits all way of determining what's the right thing to do for your child. Um, and guess what? In that way, it's kind of like many of the other decisions that you have to make as a parent. Mm -hmm. And so what do you do? Here's my theory. Ready? <laughs> Love your child. Whoa. <laughs> Listen to your child. And it's not like, it's not, it's not like um, you make a decision and it's one day and that's it. Um, it's, a, it, it's a conversation that you have, or in some cases, it's screaming matches, you know, whatever works. Um, <laughs> and, and, um, uh, you, and, and it's, um, it, it's a process that's going to go on for years in some cases. And um, it may be your child wants to transition, and that's not going to be a good choice. But you can't just say no. Uh, you, you, have to, you have to love your child and you have to pay attention and pay attention all the time as they live their life. I mean, you know, it's when we, it's, there's always this thing about, well, how did you tell your children about sex? Well, it's, you know, it's not like you have one conversation when they're, when they're six and then that's, there, you're done. You talk about, with, if, if, you're, if, you're, I think, if you're, well, if you were me, you talk about sex uh, during the course of their lives and that conversation changes as they get older. So the same thing is true, I think, for a transition. Um, and so it just means you have, to be able to, you have to be able to have a conversation and pay attention. Yeah, I think also, because the biggest hurdle I had was like not understanding how to communicate it. I think also, like, just as you would make sure your kid knows that gay people exist and that they're OK, like, make sure they see trans people in the media and that they exist and that's OK. It's just like understanding that these things are there not saying like you are that if you notice they're slightly masculine or feminine or something like that. Just like ensuring they know that these identities are real, people are that, and you can be that, and that's fine. Like you, you were talking sure. about Caitlyn Jenner backstage. Mm -hmm. with, so as a person, like people, one thing when Caitlyn came out, and Caitlyn is someone I know, and I was on that show. I don't know if you saw that show, but I was, I was, on the, I was part of the cast of the group of women who were trying to help her, kind of, you know, <laughs> get through to her. Um, uh, was the fact that there was this well-known trans person when you were in transition, did that help or did, or did it, well, yeah. did, or did it, or did it not help? Uh, it helped and hindered. Um, <laughs> so aspects of Caitlin coming out were great because it meant that there was a broader conversation around what being trans was and that kind of thing. And I was like, oh, that's a thing, cool, interesting. Um, but another aspect was that she was a slightly uh, polarizing character mm. in the people like, <laughs> Well, she's actually not nice, so that must be what all trans people are like. Um, but it was like, it was just, it was good that there was a conversation around it and that like, it opened dialogue, which wasn't really there in the mainstream media before. Yeah. Um, well, certainly not when I was younger, I didn't see any of it. Um, so yeah, I think it helped more than it hindered, but she... I know trans women who had problems with it because she came out as such a glamour puss, yeah. you know, and I think a lot of people think that transgender women, you know, are saying things like, you know, I want to be a woman because, um, you know, I love having beautiful fingernails yeah. Yeah. and eating sponge cake, you know, and, you know, you want, I, I want to say, you know, honey, eat sponge cake. You don't need a vagina for that. <laughs> you know? um, and um, so um, it, it was... I was glad I was part of that show. I was glad, I, I mean, she's still a friend of mine, but I, it was frustrating because I felt like, um, you know, I, she, she wasn't, in the end, she wasn't a feminist. And I think in some ways, 
it, uh, among the trans women, and this might be true for, for trans men as well, but you'd have to tell me, that the greatest indicator or predictor of future success is if you were a feminist before transition. Yeah. Because if you think that this is going to be a life about being pretty, you know, get used to disappointment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, want, I want to come back to something on that, but just to let people know that they can text to that number any questions, and I think magically an iPad will appear here for me to be able to see those questions. Um, you, you use the phrase lurid in your book to describe a kind of transgender that I, you don't want to be, but um, do you think that, is that a little bit of what you're talking about, the high heels and the sponge well, cake and the high I, voice and the I, I think when rising I use inflection? That, when I use that term, I want to be careful, because guess what? There's all kinds of ways of being trans, and they're all cool. And if I said that certain ways of being trans are lurid, that is um, judgmental and something I, I regret. Um, because you know, trans is an, is an umbrella term, and that's another big difference from, from when Jasper came out to, to me, is the fact that now, to be trans doesn't mean any one thing. There are genderqueer people, there are gender non-conforming people. Um, uh, you know, we, so depending on how big the umbrella is, uh, we're including drag queens, we're including intersex people, we're including uh, cross-dressers, we're including a lot of different people who have very different senses of themselves and very different things that they desire. Um, so, um, but, you know, I, what I wanted was to be at home in the body in which I lived. Um, I don't really care a whole lot about being pretty. Um, I don't care a whole lot about fashion. More's the pity, I guess. But, um, uh, you know, what I wanted was a sense of peace, um, and wholeness. And that's, and that's what I got. Um, but I don't want to cast judgment on people, because other people want different things, and, and that's, um, that's their choice, and, and more power to them. I, mean, I, th I think maybe the, the sort of default assumption is that um, you know, it's just the same thing for uh, a male to female transition as it is for a female to male transition. Um, is that true politically? psychologically, in other ways, no, I do you don't think? think, possibly politically, but I don't think in any sense of the social or medical aspects of transition it's the same. So, like, I don't know, you might be able to shed some light on this, but testosterone as a physical changer is pretty aggressive. Mm -hmm. So when you're going from a female body to transitioning to male, <coughs> testosterone kicks you in the ass. It, like, all of a sudden there's, like, hair sprouting everywhere and your voice is dropping and it's kind of awful but great because obviously it's hormones. But um, with estrogen, I don't actually know this, but it seems like it's a, like a really slow like burn kind of thing. Like it just happens over a really long time and it's yeah. sort of like, like snap as testosterone is this kind of thing. I think that's right. And it's also, I think, um, uh, well, I'm, I'm going to be so careful about generalizing, but in <laughs> my sense that most of the trans women that I know uh, transitioned um, uh, somewhat later in life. Although, I mean, I know there are early transitioners, but if, you, if you've lived your life as a straight identifying guy, and not and, and this, that's just a small segment, but I, I was some, someone who's always attracted to women. Um, so I had male privilege, I had straight privilege, and then to suddenly find myself um, bereft of both of those things, because now, because my wife and I were still together after 30 years, 12 as husband and wife, 18 now as wife and wife, so now we're a lesbian couple. Uh, <laughs> still with me? <laughs> um, so that loss of privilege was, um, it wasn't a surprise to me, but it was, it was, a, it was a shock. Yeah, well I, had the opposite experience. experience because I was a female and had a girlfriend at the time. Um, so I was like a gay woman and then all of a sudden I got straight male privilege. And <laughs> I didn't feel like I'd like nice done anything to this. No, <laughs> literally. I was like, okay, great, that's perfect. But I was treated so differently to how I was before in like social situations, that kind of thing. All of a sudden I was like respected in a way that I wasn't before, which was like totally bizarre, because the same person. Right, because so, so a lot of the uh, trans guys that I know, not all, 
bending over backwards not to generalize, yeah. but a lot of the trans guys that I know um, e emerge out of um, a lesbian identity. Yeah. Um, and kind of a butch identity. Yeah. And so already knew what it was like to be um, uh, in, uh, in a minority in this culture. So as, by, as a result of being female, yeah. as a result of being lesbian, um, as a result of being butch lesbian. So to go um, from there to where you are now, is th that's a very different experience. And I think a lot of trans women that I know, especially ones who transitioned late, can't quite understand that um, and, th and I see this with my friend Caitlin, that she still has all this kind of vestigial male privilege yeah. um, that you kind of need to let go of, which doesn't mean you let go of your sense of confidence or your sense of authority, but you need to, to understand that um, the world um, is arranged in a very different way. Mm. So, so you, you both have very strong identities and your gender transition took place in the context of that confidence that you know you you display today, mm -hmm. and you it sounds like you had very strong supportive people around you. Um, what about for people who lack that? People for whom um, gender identity issues are part of a broader uncertainty about who they are, where they belong in the world. Um, sometimes very reality-based because they don't belong anywhere because they, you know, lack the kind of strong family. And can either of you comment about that? Yeah, uh, I think, I mean, the decision to transition is not like doesn't happen quickly. Um, so I think for anyone that's kind of just more generally identity confused, um, I would urge them to think about things a lot because there's like. Hormones, obviously going on hormones is a really hard thing to do to your body. Um, so it's, and it's not something you can reverse totally, um, or at all in some cases. But um, I just think with those kind of things, it, like people really, really need to think about transitioning as like a very, very life milestone because it's like something, it like changes your life totally. So um, these things, you can't really just be like, oh, I might transition today and then I might transition back tomorrow because it might be fun. Um, it's like a really hard and years, like year long process before you start to feel good in these kind of identities. So it's like, I just think for a long time before making Yeah, it. I think it's important to say though that the two of us represent a very binary sense of gender. Mm -hmm. And if I see one thing uh, in the world now that I, that I didn't see 20 years ago, um, it's increasingly people who, who uh, are gender non-conforming um, and who uh, do not identify as at either end of the of, of the spectrum, yeah. um, and and that's a good thing. Um, it, and it, you know, it's awkward that it's just the two it's the two of it's the two of us representing the trans community, <laughs> community here. But there's a lot of people in the middle now who um, uh, have a, yet another take on on gender, and it's either wanting to be gender fluid, which is to say, to kind of move. Um, um, along the spectrum of gender, um, or people who kind of want to live in a, in a gender-free world, live in a kind of um, mm -hmm. uh, a more of an androgynous space. And you know what? That's also cool. And those people deserve love and support, and should be able to live their lives without having to constantly explain and defend mm -hmm. themselves mm -hmm. either. Yeah, I think it was. Oh, I'm not sure whether it was you, but it was on your panel yesterday when I wrote down the quote: "Truly emancipating politics celebrates ambiguity." Yeah, that's great. Um, there's a question from the audience. Um, trans identifier aside, what are the main societal differences you've noticed between view being viewed as a man versus as a woman? So what are, <laughs> what are the biggest challenges you've found after experiencing both genders? Do you want to take that uh, one? Yeah. Um, well, before, I was, so I was identified as a gay female, I guess. Um, and that is like a very, like it's a minority, but I also am still white and understand that that's a privilege in itself. Um, but like a lot of that, like I was scared of men, like didn't know how to talk to them because they were like, I was a woman at the time. But after transitioning, all these things like socially happened where I could talk in situations that I couldn't before because I understood 
how to talk to women in a way that I didn't seem threatening because that's how I would have perceived men as threatening. Um, but also, people talked to me like I knew things when I didn't. <laughs> it was like totally bizarre. People would ask me things, I'd be like, I think you should ask the adult female next to me who actually knows the answer to that question. But like, yeah, it's just like the perception that you're better than you are. It's really like totally bizarre. <laughs> it's like so strange. Okay, and, and my take on it is, um, I, I, uh, um, more depressingly, I feel vulnerable in this culture in a way that I didn't before. Um, just, I mean, and I know Hobart's a very safe city, um, but you know, I've, the last couple of nights I've had dinner down in, in you know, in the in the waterfront, the harbor, and I've walked back to the hotel. That's a, and it's what it's a 15-minute walk, but I've been walking by myself, and. Um, and maybe it's because I don't know Hobart, it's, and I'm a little bit uncertain of where I am, but I felt, I felt a, a kind of f fear, fear is maybe too strong a word, but certainly anxiety about walking home by myself um, mm -hmm. that I didn't used to feel. Um, and um, I, I've been under threat of violence maybe half a dozen times for being trans in my life over the last 20 years, but I've been under threat of um, aggression uh, for, for being female dozens and dozens and dozens of times. And, um, and I wasn't socialized about how to deal with men. Um, uh, I remember I used to play in a band, I used to play in a rock and roll band, and we were, play, we were playing at this bar one night, and there was a break, we took a break, we went up to the bar, everybody was getting drinks, and this guy came up to me and he said, hey, uh, I have a question for you. Was your daddy a thief? And I'm like, what? No, he said, well, I don't know. Someone stole the stars and put them in your eyes. <laughs> and I said, why, thank you. Isn't that a nice thing to say? And that's when the lead singer, who is my, my girlfriend, Laura, pulled me away. And she said, what is wrong with you? I said, what? She said, you said, you said, thank you? Thank you? That's not what you say to a guy like that. I said, what do you say? She says, you say, Fuck you! <laughs> Leave me alone! I said, really? But he, he seemed, he didn't seem to mean any harm. She said, Jenny, harm is exactly what he had in mind. <laughs> so these are the things I didn't learn, and so now I'm, I'm, I've had to, to learn to feel that the world is not mine, and that I'm at risk. How did you want to comment on any of that? Oh gosh, that's, a, that's an amazing anecdote. <laughs> um, well, I just, I'm curious, I, I just wanted to hear more, and maybe that's, that was what the anecdote was to illustrate, more about the aggression for being female, your experience of that. Um, is, is, is that an example? What aggression? you just mm -hmm, The aggression that you received oh, for being female. So violence, separate from aggression, but you're saying that yeah. the aggression experiences were more common. Well, the other thing is also that I've gone from being a very young looking uh, you know, late, in my late 30s, mm -hmm. to 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 being, uh, you know, middle aged. Late and may, middle aged might be the generous term for it. Um, uh, so part of it is also dif the difference between going from one kind of female mm -hmm. part of your life to to being an older woman. Mm -hmm. And now suddenly, um, I'm invisible. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I, um, you know, I, I I can be in situations and people have just no idea that I'm even there. Um, and um, in some ways, that's good because I feel protected by that. Mm -hmm. And the other, like, and the other times when I really resent, like, I, I remember walking down the streets in New York City, and I remember literally, so such a cliche, the construction workers whistling, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and like 80% of me was like, how dare they? And 20% of me was, Jenny Boylan's got it going on. <laughs> <laughs> and now nobody whistles, oh. and part of me is like. Yeah, that. well, yeah, that's, that's good, because I'm, I'm not an object. And part of me is like, hello. <laughs> I'm here. Um, but that doesn't answer your question. No, but, I, no, but, it's, but that's another great anecdote, so thank you for sharing. Uh, there's a question. What's your advice to a 15-year-old girl who wants to transition to a boy, but her parents are telling her it's a phase she'll get through? The, the parents are saying what? It, it's a phase. You'll get through it's it. It's a phase would find some outside support. Um, I don't know where this kid lives, but there's like so many places you can go, or even just to your GP, and say, hey, listen, 
I'm having these problems with my parents, but I feel these emotions. And like, they will set them up with like a psychologist so they can talk about these things and like ways to deal with it that you can do before you turn 18. Um, but also try and communicate that it's not a phase. If you can in a way, because I know with people like that, it's like they've made up their mind and so you'll get through it. Um, like just making sure they understand that you're not gonna get through it and when you turn 18, you're gonna do your thing. But yeah, talk to someone outside your family, <laughs> I would. And my advice would be to the parents. It's the parents of the people who, who need someone to talk to them. They need to know that they're not losing their child. Um, and they need to know that being trans is not, it's not a bad thing. It's not, you know, it's not like, um, something, it's not like something terrible has happened. There's a, there's a dramatic change that's happening. Um, but um, um, your, your child's going to be okay. And, um, uh, yeah, they need, they, need to, they need to understand that. What about the issue that comes up um, where kids, perhaps this person, perhaps this 15-year-old has been feeling this way for a very long time, and then it seems like a pretty good bet that they're going to continue to feel that way. Um, but I'd be curious to hear what the panel think about, um, about kids who are of younger ages. So I'm seeing this right now. I have twins, boy and a girl, um, for now. Um, and they are, and they're, they've got, but they've got friends in both of their classrooms. And I live in Southern California. Um, friends in both their classrooms who are transitioning, or who have transitioned, um, and there, there are three kids in, between their two classrooms out of sixty kids. So that seems surprisingly like a surprisingly large number. These are younger kids, um, and I've seen some of them pop, sort of pop in and out of adopting a, tr a trans um, identity. Um, and so, you know, that is a real head scratcher. They're, they're just about to start going through puberty. Um, and that, that I think, is, is, is a tough one, especially because just the vocabulary was not present in years before. And now the vocabulary and the identities and the media figures are now present. And so people can observe them and say, that's a thing. I think that's me. That, you know, I, I, I get what I am. And that's like in an ideal situation. But other kids might just be like really uncomfortable in their skin for who knows why. And they think, I need to do something else with my identity. Here are the possibilities. Maybe I'm going to try that one. And I don't, want, I don't want to trivialize anybody's experiences, but I'm just opening up the question. Could it be that, that there are all of these possibilities that um, apply to these individual cases of kids so young? Yeah. I mean, it's hard to pinpoint individual cases and what will happen. Mm -hmm. But certainly in my experience, from kind of the age of three, when I can remember things, it was like a very that was that, mm -hmm. and I was just a boy. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't so much that I understood that I wasn't a boy, it was just that, um, like, my brothers weighed to stand up and I was confused as to why I couldn't do that. Um, but it was kind of more that I didn't have the facilities to communicate that. I just kind of presented masculine at school and declared myself Max and all this kind of thing. Um, um, but I think a lot of the time with kids, obviously not every time, um, but they will be, because kids are so like, well, that's that, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to walk over here, and you're not going to tell me otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, often they will be very sure about their identity from quite young. Like, they will appear quite masculine and quite mm -hmm. feminine. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to say with kids that kind of go back and forth. They may just be scared of the social sure. kind of thing, or they yeah. may just not be sure of their identity. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, it's hard to say in those kind of individuals. Yeah, just people, you have to keep having the conversation. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, the, the danger is um, you're five, five years old and people will say, you're too young. You're 15 years old, people will say, well, it's just adolescence and you're, you're, you're mental. You're 25 years old and people will say, well, it's, you know, you're just having, you're, you're 35 years old, you're just having a midlife crisis. You're 45 years old, people say, well, you're too old. <laughs> so... Um, but the, the, the question which you've asked in some ways remains unanswered. What do we do about kids for whom transition is not going to be, um, is not going to lead to a happier life? Um, and and I, I wish that I could tell you 
an easy, an easy thing to do. But all we, can, all we can do is love our children and keep talking to them. And the way, the, the quickest way to, to lose your ability to talk to your, to your child is to cut them off mm -hmm. and to say, um, you can't do that. We said no. If you, want, if, you want, if you want to drive your child away, and this is just not only about being trans. If you want to drive your child away, shut them down. Don't talk to them. Um, you have to have the conversations even when they're very awkward and difficult. Because mm -hmm. that's, I mean, that's, you know, parenting is a it's, a, it's a, it's a job that never stops. And it's not always fun. But this is what we and do. There's you no show. instruction booklet. Yeah. Sure would be helpful. Yeah. <laughs> I have to apologize, we've got another 15 or 20 great questions here, but we're out of time for today. So could you join me in thanking our three fantastic panelists? Thanks, man. It's really good to meet you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Am I on? Hi everybody, this is just a reminder that Marty and Jenny will be signing books in the foyer and we now have a 30 minute break until Are You Black Enough? Thank you. <laughs>